logically everything was screaming like this is the right track this is you know when you want to get pregnant you're going to get maternity pay this is sensible you've got to stay but like this feeling just in my gut and in my body was like nope we can't do this anymore and it just got louder and louder and louder and then i just was like okay i've just got to i've got to burn the boat so it's mainly focused on weight loss and body image and then it's interesting, I actually veered away from that topic, mainly because I I thought, I felt a little bit like there was things I hadn't quite healed from that myself. And so although I was having amazing results, I was seeing like, you know, people sending those incredible testimonials. I also sort of felt like not fully embodied in it, in that I was still having some issues around body image and, you know, wanting to lose weight and um, being quite restrictive with myself still. And it was actually my younger sister who said to me, do you think like this is the right area for you to go into given that you've still got issues? And it kind of hit me because I was like, she's so right. Like this is, it didn't feel like I was being honest given that I was still suffering with, you know, being very hard on myself, restricting, being really controlled, measuring everything. Um, and it really hit ahead. And so I ended up going into, you know, working with women in business, working with them, having like blocks that they were having around money and uh, not feeling good enough and imposter syndrome. And when I moved to Portugal, it's so bizarre because I was so happy to be here. Um, but I was noticing myself like I could not stop eating. I think I gained about 10 pounds in four weeks. I was really good all day and then I'd be like going into the into the kitchen and I'd be like <gasps> panic eating chocolate and sweets and just like shoving everything down and you know my I was hiding it from my boyfriend because I was so embarrassed about it I was like okay right from tomorrow I'm doing this from tomorrow I'm tomorrow I'm gonna start again like I'll just have this one last like basically binge of like shoving all this chocolate in my mouth I'll chuckle the packets to the back of the cupboard and then and then tomorrow it's fine I'll be good I'll just get this back under control. And then I, I finally hit a point where I was like, I've gained about 10 pounds. I don't even want to show up on Instagram because now I'm feeling like bloated and puffy and not good in my body. And I was like, okay, we've got to, like you've got to actually use the tools that you use with other people on yourself. And so I basically created like a protocol for myself and like got to the root cause of like why I was doing it. And it's so funny because what I always believed was like, I just needed more control and more discipline and I needed to be even stricter. But actually the control and the discipline and the being strict was making it 10 times worse because my, my, I think we pick up so many patterns from childhood and the pattern that I had was like, if I'm feeling stressed, if I'm feeling anxious, if I'm feeling sad, any of the feelings like I'd, I'd go to food because it's super effective. You eat a bit of chocolate and within about a minute, you're like, oh, I feel a bit good. <laughs> but the problem is it doesn't last. And then you start feeling even worse and you get into these cycles. Um, so it really came back to shifting like my identity and how I saw myself and then really working on like, like regulating my nervous system and like breaking out of all of these old patterns. Um, and now I have this like, I basically reshifted again and now all I want to do is help people with emotional eating and uh, binge eating and overeating because I feel like it just impacts every area of our life. Um, it's, it's not just, for me, it wasn't like, oh, it's just this like one area that's contained. It was like, it impacts my relationship. It impacts my, like how I feel about myself. It impacts my confidence. It impacts how I show up for work. And it's such a, um, it just ripples into every area of our lives. Um, so that, that's now become my, my focus again. Cool. So how did you go about healing it? So firstly, it was, I did this um, sort of exercise because I got, I got clear on what my triggers were. So there's, well, firstly, you, I go through, this is what I go through with myself and that I've been with, with clients is like the physical stuff. Like sometimes it's not emotional eating. Sometimes actually you're just, you, you're not giving your body all the things it needs. Like coffee is, black coffee is not a breakfast. 
And so for me, when I started, uh, so firstly, I like hit all the physical stuff. So it was like, okay, I'm going to make sure I get protein in the morning for breakfast, make sure I'm hydrated, um, you know, tick all the physical stuff off. And then for the emotional stuff, I have sort of a morning, afternoon and evening uh, recordings that I created for myself. They're pretty short because, you know, I, I, it, often when you make things too long, you don't stick to them. So the morning I use um, some visualization and some breath work because that helps me get really like grounded in my body. Um, the afternoon I use, because the thing is we have these patterns that are just like, I don't feel good, I go for food. And when when you start to like break them and become conscious of them, then you can move into a different direction. So now when I start feeling overwhelmed, I'll do a two minute breath work exercise, for example. And then that makes you feel 10 times better afterwards than the food that's just sort of a momentary hit. And for me, the hardest part to let go of was the controlling of it. Because I was like, but if I let go and I stop controlling it, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna eat everything in sight. I'm gonna get huge. Like, I can't do this. And that sounds really vain, but like, I also, you know, I, I also do value being healthy, having energy, like good digestion. And when you're sort of shoving all this food down really quickly, you're not even enjoying it. You're just sort of trying to calm yourself. And so I came up with like a, a whole raft of different tools that I use, like breath work, like journaling, like hypnosis really to help like bring the body back into like a state of regulation because when we're calm and we're not obsessing about food we actually make really good choices normally because we want to feel good and so you know yes if if i want to eat a cookie now i'll eat a cookie but it doesn't need to turn into eating 20 because i've had a slip up and so i may as well just you know go wild for the rest of the day which is very much how it used to be Mm. Um, and even one thing that's really interesting is like the language of the subconscious mind, because when we say things like, I can't have that, I'm not allowed that you can, you like feel it in your body instantly. There's like that, Oh, but I want it. And so when you, even when you change your language around things, instead of, I can't have that, you could be like, I'm going to have that later, or I'm just choosing not to have that. Cause I want to feel, you know, energized today. It really shifts sort of the way that we think about things. Um, and I guess the last piece is, um, I don't know if you've struggled with, with food at all, but I think one of the big pieces I struggled with and most of my clients do is like this guilt and shame cycle of like beating ourselves up, being really awful on ourselves. Like, um, and so breaking that cycle of just like, it was just a piece of pizza or it was it, like, it, it's we don't need to go down this huge huge spiral because the issue is if we if say we don't feel good and then we eat food to make us feel better but we say gain weight and so we get very upset about it and that brings us back down and we say right I'm going to do all these diets we really restrict and control things and that doesn't make us feel good so then we want food and then we beat ourselves up and shame ourselves and we just end up bouncing back and forth and yo-yoing Whereas actually when you just remove all the like restrictions, you remove the, the pressure bubble that you've put yourself in, you're like, oh, actually I'm not that bothered about having the chocolate now that I'm, you know, not restricting it. Yes. Okay. So how do you break the guilt and shame cycle? So I love doing like, um, like these cord cutting forgiveness meditations, because if you there's a guy who I started training with doing uh, rapid resolution therapy and his name's Dr. John Connolly. He's incredible. And he sort of explains it as if say you get, say you get um, blue and red paint and you pour them into water, they're going to mix and make purple. And so if you go on this, you know, cycle of just binging, for example, like, if you could have done better than you would have, like at any time, it's sort of a cause and effect. Like we're doing the best that we can at the time with what the resources that we have. And when these like aggressive urges come on to just eat everything, like you cannot fight against that biology. 
because you've got your conscious mind, which is 10% of um, your reality and your actions. And then you've got your subconscious, which is 90%. And so trying to use willpower, which is this 10%, to control the 90%, it's like trying to push a rock up a hill. You just, you just can't, you can't fight that. Whereas if you find out what the, the cause is and you deal with that and then you take away all the pressure from feeling, you know, beating yourself up afterwards and you just use it as like, oh, OK. So like the other week, for example, I um, went out for a few drinks and had a couple of sweet cocktails. And afterwards I was like, oh, my God, I really want an ice cream on the way home and had an ice cream. Like one, it's just an ice cream. We don't need to like beat ourselves up and. Because we also create these stories. I used to create so many stories. I ate an ice cream. And now that must mean that I'm never going to lose the weight. I'm never, this is never going to happen. And when I was, when I was single, I used to always get in these stories of like, I'm never going to meet someone because if I'm not this size, then I'm never going to meet someone. And then it, this is going to happen. And I'd go on these like crazy stories <laughs> that I was like totally making up in my mind that just aren't true. Whereas when we're actually like, it was just an ice cream, like it's really not that big a deal. And then it get curious and be like, ah, oh, I wonder why like I had that craving. And for me, it's like, if I have a couple of drinks, I'm fine. If I'm having like three or four and they're a bit sweet, then my cravings just increase. Or, you know, getting really curious about like, but what are your, what are the things that like set you off? Um, you know, if, is it, you have an argument with someone or you have a stressful day at work and you just want to come home and, you know, grab a bag of chips. And sometimes like that's all you want to do. But most of the time there's a better option. And so if you can break the patterns, so you're, it's like um, cause and effect or symptom and response. Like I feel stressed, I eat the chips. But if you can come at it from two ways of like things that you do throughout the day that reduce your stress and then also have another solution for yourself like okay next time I feel like this I'm gonna um you know go take myself through a breathing exercise that could you know can just take a minute like you can really shift how you feel in a minute with breathing um it's you it's helpful to have like these tools in your back pocket and the more you do it the more ingrained these new patterns become so at first you're like oh this is hard work <laughs> But it does get easier and easier, and then that just becomes your go-to, and the old pattern just falls away because you've you've rewired the new pattern in your mind. So I guess in that moment that you have the craving, like you're feeling stressed, and it's like, okay, I want a brownie. Mm -hmm. Do you tell yourself like, cool, yeah, we can have the brownie. Let's just do like a breathing exercise to calm down, or journal, or something, and then like in ten minutes, let's go and eat that exactly so, okay. exactly right so like it's not like I can't have that it's like of course you can have that but why don't we just we're going to do this first and if you still want it afterwards you can go and have it nine times out of ten you don't actually want it anymore um sometimes you do still want the brownie and you enjoy it and it's great but it's it's instead of it just feeling like you're out of control and you're not even make you know, sometimes it feels like you're not even making these choices. They're just like happening and you're like feel out of control. And then you're like, I just need to be more disciplined. But actually, like it's just creating a little bit of space that allows you to, you know, OK, you know what? I'm just going to do two minute breathing exercise. If I still want it afterwards, I'll have it. But at least then I've made the decision as opposed to feeling like you're just on autopilot. Mm. Okay, so what did the process look like for you and how long did it take for things to shift? So for me, the process of so the morning was a visualization because so the subconscious mind doesn't know the difference between what's real and what's imagined. So if you even visualize yourself, so what I did was like, okay, if the, I, my sort of ideal version of me, how would she, how would she think? How would she feel? How would she act around food? And for me, I wanted it to feel like neutral. Like it's, you know, not so emotional, not so, oh my God, I've got to stay away from that. Not so tense. I mean, I remember going on, um, I went away with my uh, boyfriend to Seville and we'd had breakfast and then we're like walking around and he honestly likes to go past every single restaurant in the entire city before he decides where we're going to eat. And I didn't even realize that I had a fear of being hungry. 
And so I would get start getting agitated and I'd be like, we've been walking around for an hour. Like, why can't we just sit down and eat? Why do we have to check out every, and he just, he's so chilled. He'd be like, okay, we'll sit down. And I realized when I started going through this process, like what are all the beliefs I've got around food? Like what are all the beliefs that I have around myself? And start to like break these down. So like, yeah, that I had a real fear of like, if I don't eat, I'm going to go on this huge binge. I'm going to feel totally out of control. I have to have everything really organized. And so when I started being like, how do I actually want to feel? I want to feel super neutral. I want to be able to like walk around and be relaxed and be like, cool, I'm, you know, I don't know, grab an apple en route if I need a snack, but it not be running my life. I wanted to just feel like free around food. Um, And so I got super clear on where I was, where I was and where I wanted to be and what the things were in between. So one of them was a belief that um, if I'm not, if I'm not really slim, then I like, I won't be loved or like people won't like me as much. And when you start breaking these thought, these beliefs down, because a lot of these, most of our beliefs are formed before the age of 14 and most before the age of seven. And so, you know, if you've got a belief of like, um, I'm not good enough as I am, you're always trying to fix things and perfect things. And, you know, always, there's always like this fixing approach and And one of the big ways that can come about in is like how you look in your body. And, and so, you know, getting kind of taking the pressure valve off, like I need to be a size like eight or whatever it is. That was one of the beliefs that I worked through. Another one was the fear of eating. Another one was I deserve food. That was a big one. So I would go like wild on a Friday night because I'd be like, but I've worked so hard. I deserve this. And actually when, again, when I took myself through, I had like a belief process of like breaking it down, doing a bit of like somatic stuff going through it. It's like, you don't, I don't deserve the burger if the burger's gonna make me feel bad afterwards. Like it, the, where I wanted to be was like, I could think about eating it and it felt good. I could eat it and enjoy it. And I can look back and be like, oh, that was really yummy. But if you're beating yourself up afterwards, then it's, it's not an enjoyable process. Um, so, so I kind of went through breaking down all the beliefs that I had. Um, and then it was, uh, regulating myself in the morning. So that was through a visualization of like how I wanted to feel around food, being neutral, the feelings that I would have around it. And then in the afternoon, it would be, cause often we dip again in the afternoon. We're like pretty good in the morning. And that's when our motivation is really high. And then the afternoon we start to come off a bit. So it's just like a three second recording I would make for myself. It would just be like breathing, connecting back to my body, checking in like how I'm feeling. Um, And then in the evening, I created a hypnosis for myself that I would listen to whilst I was falling asleep. That's just sort of wiring in like new habits, um, you know, slowing down, uh, chewing my food properly, drinking water, um, focusing on how I was feeling. And it's so it's so funny now, like the foods, I mean, I still love things like pizza, but it's not a craving anymore of like, I need to have it. I need to have it. It's like, Oh, I'm going to go and have it and enjoy it. It's going to be great. And then that's it. Um, it's not feeling, it's not feeling, I felt controlled by food before. And I was so embarrassed about it. I had so much shame. I was like, why can't I just fix this? Like what's wrong with me? Um, And so it's, yeah, it's just felt like the most like freeing thing to no longer be obsessing and no longer being counting or weighing and restricting and then going wild. Um, And how quickly did you start to notice the change? So I started to notice the change probably within of doing these exercises consistently, I noticed the change very quickly within a few days. Um, I definitely would see the things still pop up around because what I things I used to do is like, you know, go into the I'd see myself in the mirror and I'd be like, Oh, I don't like that. I don't like that. Those things took longer to change. But I noticed myself just from like slowing down understanding like I wasn't going to die if I didn't eat, you know, every three hours. I noticed those changes very, very quickly. Um, And as soon as I stopped telling myself I couldn't have everything, even then 
I, when I walk around a supermarket, I'm like, I can, you can have anything you want here. Like it's, it's all just a choice. Um, yeah. And it's not going anywhere and it's not going to run out. Yeah. (sighs) Yeah. Okay. I've dealt with really similar stuff. It's so interesting, but probably I was less, I was never so much on the control side, but definitely Mm -hmm like the battles that take up so much energy, like intense cravings that they are, it's like a compulsion. And it's so, mine will be so specific. It'll be like, you need to walk like 40 minutes across London to get me like this specific hot chocolate that I want now. And it's this voice that's like so overpowering. And exactly Mm. as you say, it's like, you can't fight it. Like you can try, it just, it doesn't work. So, but this morning, it's so weird. This morning I saw, I've been having this amazing, like, energy healing stuff. <laughs> anyway, oh, love it. And about, like, other helping with, like, other stuff. But I brought something up because mine is to do with deprivation, as you say, from childhood. So mine's to do with mm-hmm. this story that my brother had diabetes and then the food in the house changed because it was like, okay, he can't have this food. But then me as a four-year-old, suddenly it's like, I'm not allowed these things. And then going to school and it's like, all the other kids have this in their lunchbox Mm. and I'm not allowed it. Oh, but my brother, who obviously had an illness and it's horrible, but like a four-year-old doesn't know. I just saw like, oh, he has this secret drawer of lollies because that's like his emergency food if his blood sugar drops. But I just saw it as like, he has special food and I'm not allowed it. And I would go and take it and then Mm. get in so much trouble. So then I got another belief that's like I'm a bad, horrible person because I stole something that's meant to like save his life. So, mm. oh my god! So that was like a lot of like undoing, which maybe you helped me with some of that. Um, but but now with the with the food thing, it's so I still have this obsession with like being deprived and like needing treats because it's like I wasn't allowed that. So, mm-hmm. and sh- this morning she said to me, she's like, "Okay, you that four year old." didn't get the lollies and like her sibling had these special lollies that's so painful for a four-year-old you need to go and buy yourself a lolly jar buy like a beautiful ceramic jar sorry lollies are like sweets um not lollipops or oh okay sweets um so she's like buy a um she's australian as well so she knows what lollies <laughs> um Yeah, so just like buy this sweet jar and fill it with sweets. And that is your sweet jar for your four-year-old self. And it was great. I just like started crying because it was like, oh, my God, like I'm allowed a sweet jar. Like that's, oh, my God, so bizarre. But then Mm. already it's like, yeah, obviously I'm not going to. Well, yeah, she's like maybe you finish the sweets super quickly the first time. But then as it's just there and it's always full. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's just obvious, like you'll get, you'll just know, like I'm worthy of having this. It's always there. There's no scarcity. Mm -hmm. I'm not being deprived. Oh, but it's such a, (laughs) it has so many emotions involved in this stuff. And it's like, we have to face it. It's not like alcohol or cigarettes or drugs or something that you can remove completely. Like you can't remove food. Mm. (sighs) and also, so the, um, this is again, Dr. John Connolly's teachings, but he's like, he calls it the moralistic thinking that we have. And so when we're kids and, you know, there's nothing, our parents are not doing this, you know, out of maliciousness or malintent, but they basically tell us, you know, be a good girl and Santa's going to come. Or, you know, they'll say like, God's watching you. And so as kids, we're like, I've got to be good. And if I'm good, good things will happen. And then, so that's the belief that we form. And then ultimately life comes along and bad things do happen. And we form this belief, oh, that happened because I'm not good enough. Like, so you might be like, oh, I didn't get sweets because I'm not good enough. Like they, you know, again, I'm not sure what your beliefs, but these are some of the things you might have then started to think or like, I don't get sweets because I'm not good enough. And so now the sweets represent you feeling like, you're enough, you're good enough, you get love. And so it's never the food, it's always like what it represents to us and what it means to us. And that like, 
when you can, and that's also why when, I mean, I remember when I went to a really low weight when I was like in my early twenties and I always thought like, when I get to this weight, then I'll feel X or when I'm like this, then I'll feel X. And it just, it's not the way that it works because if it's hard to achieve it, it's going to be hard to maintain it. And then you're going to live in fear of like, what if I lose this? Or like, I'm you, you know, you have, it, it does start with like an inside out, like where can you, um, give that to yourself? So like one of the things I used to, one of the things I love doing with clients is, um, we all have like negative things that we say to ourselves. And especially when people go on like these, these binging and restrict cycles, people might be like, oh, I'm just so lazy. Like, why am I lazy? And I'll say like, well, what are three like benefits of you being lazy? Like what if, because our minds are not against us. Like they're really, they really, it can feel like they are, but they're really trying to like soothe us, to make us feel happy, to make us feel better. And this whole like, idea behind feeling like we're against ourselves or there's pieces of us that are like against us it's like all of the parts are like they're trying to do something for us we just got to understand what that is so that we can find a better way to give that to ourselves and so you know the like the beating ourselves up like that our mind doesn't respond well to being like told off like if it did then when drug addicts and alcoholics shame themselves afterwards, they wouldn't drink again, but they do. They drink more because they feel even worse. And then the alcohol takes away the feeling bad. So then they drink more and it's, it's you know, it's always these like repetitive cycles. Um, yes. you, as exactly as you said, you can't think your way out of it. And probably it's interesting you saying about you going across town to get a hot chocolate because you're probably like, I'm an adult now. I can get what I want when I want, no matter how elaborate it is. Like, I don't, you know, I can, I can have whatever I want. Yeah. And then, yeah, it is so interesting that I have that other same fear, I guess, that obviously it triggers like another part of me that's like, yes, I have to look in a certain way. Like it's super unsafe to be out of control or like, to put on weight would be terrifying. So it's like, <gasps> then it triggers that other part trying to control it and being like, oh no, this has happened. Because that other part's obviously so scared that of what will happen if I put on weight, which it's mm-hmm. like, who can, you know, it's like you can ch- lose it again. Like it's safe, you know, it's okay. But it's like, that does not feel safe to me. It's like, oh my God it's a spiral like it will never end I'll never ever be able to yeah because I guess it it feels out of control when you're when it feels like a compulsion Mm -hmm. to go and get something and then it's like I don't know if this will end and then yeah you do just imagine yourself like putting on loads and loads of weight and just being stuck there forever but the what's so interesting is is that it's because the reason is is because we, when we say I'm going to be really good tomorrow and then we're not because ultimately we don't feel good and then we need the food to soothe ourselves. Then we like start breaking trust with ourselves. And then we're like, I don't trust myself. I don't trust myself because if I'm not controlling myself, then I'm going to go wild. I'm going to be put on like 10 stone. And it's not just the weight. It's like what we think it means. Like then you know, I either will lose the love of the people I have, or I won't get this, or I'll lose something I have, or I won't get something that I want. And when you like go through these stories, most of the time, I'd say 99% of the time, like they're not true anyway. Like I, I mean, I dated, I also think like life is such a mirror to us. I remember dating this guy and he, I had, I'd, I was, I was yo-yoing at the time with weight and I'd lost a bit of weight and his friend went, I would heard him in the kitchen and his friend goes, oh, uh, Melissa looks amazing. And he went, yeah, she's getting there. And I was like, huh? and like, now if I heard someone say that, I'd be like, fuck you. <laughs> like, I wouldn't care. But it, when you feel like that's true, it feels like such a punch in your stomach because you believe it. And it was like, 
I didn't realize it at the time because I was too I was too young. But I, re- I see that as like life's way of being like this is something for you to heal like and clear. Like it's not true. And when you when you actually come from a place of like appreciating your body, respecting your body, as opposed to punishing it, hating it, and shaming it, you actually naturally choose healthier foods. And the other thing is, what's so wild is your when you're eating in that state of like stress and panic, your body's in a fight or flight response. So it can't digest your food properly. It can't metabolize things properly. So actually the impact it has on your body, they did like studies of people eating um, food under stress versus eating it with friends laughing. And the impact that they did it on, I think they did it on twins or sisters, I can't remember. And the impact it had on their bodies was like so drastically different in terms of digestion, what it did to their blood sugar. Um, and so the state in which we're eating also has such a huge impact. And so we, I think the, the, the belief is if I don't control this, I'm going to go wild. But actually when you stop controlling it, you calm down. Like when, since I've stopped controlling it, my hunger has dropped like off a cliff. Like, because I use these tools like, you know, breath work, like, you know, getting more grounded, like calming down. And when you feel more like level and calm, as opposed to like this, when I'm like this, because also your mind's super smart. When you're feeling a bit stressed or you're feeling a bit sad, mainly when you're feeling stressed, if you're eating food, you're signaling to your mind that it's safe. Because if you're being chased by a lion or if there was a real threat, you wouldn't be eating, you'd be running. And so it does, food does ground you, but if you fi- if you can ground yourself before that happens, you don't end up going into those spirals and, um, you know, you don't, you don't end up, and you don't end up then just going wild, um, because you're like, oh, I can have what I want when I want it. I actually don't want it so much now. Yes. <laughs> so good. Okay. Oh my God, such a big topic. But I want to hear about your story of how you became a coach. Yeah. Uh, Beginning with how you grew up. So I grew up in London initially, and then I lived in London until I was five. Um, And then my dad died when I was five. And so my mum moved. I have uh, an older sister, a younger sister and a brother. So my mum moved us up to Cheshire which is like south of Manchester, uh, to be nearer to her family. Um, because yeah, we didn't, we didn't have much other family in London. Oh, I'm so sorry about losing your dad. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it's funny. I don't remember that much from, I think my sister remembers more, um, from that period. I don't remember that much. But now when I look back at it, I'm like, I don't know how my mom, I mean, my mom had four kids under the age of seven. Um, and we were like little terrors as well when she, because we, we moved up to the country and we were just like, I think that was definitely the best thing for us to do. Cause there was like lots of outdoor space. You know, we had, we had, a, you know, she was, an, she is an incredible mother. We had an amazing upbringing. Um, but I, yeah, it's interesting when I, in my twenties started going into more of like the self-development work and then being like, ah, like getting kind of curious and being like, wow, like even the things that happen when you're young, like they do shape the beliefs that you have or the, um, the way you see yourself in the world. So do you have memories of that? Like that change? So I don't have many, but when I did, so I, um, I did a rapid transformational therapy session when I was in my sort of late twenties. And that was when I had, uh, like memories come forward. And so I had this memory of when my dad died and I formed a belief like, well, he, he left because I wasn't good enough because you know, you're a five-year-old, you're not rational. You're not, you don't have the four, the part of your brain yet that can make rational decisions. And so it was so fascinating to me to then look back at where this belief had like, you know, run throughout my entire life when it was, you know, things that I used to do a lot with things like people pleasing. Um, I was really indecisive. I'd always be like, oh, you know, whatever you want to do, like I'm easy. 
um, you know, and it didn't have very good boundaries, like all of these things that come from that I realized afterwards came from this belief of like, I'm not good enough. So I have to do all these things to make people like me. Um, and it was so interesting. There's a lady called Andrea Crowder and she was talking about people pleasing. And she said, she, she said that she used to be a big people pleaser. And then she realized that actually people pleasing is manipulating other people to like you because you're changing your behavior to suit what you think they would like. So they like you. And I was like, wow. I always thought I was being so like nice and, you know, I'm helping other people. And, you know, really I was like, wow, it is kind of a form of manipulation. It was such an amazing reframe. Um, yeah, I found that one that really powerful, but it was, it was so interesting to see how we form these beliefs. We don't question them and then they run our entire lives. Um, it's that, what's the quote? Show me the man at seven and I'll show, show me the boy at seven and I'll show you the man. Because unless like we go through these and we pick them apart and we realize the ones that aren't true or aren't serving us, um, they just continue to run everything. So are your earliest memories then of being in Cheshire pretty much? Yeah, yeah. I don't really remember much from London. I just remember, I just remember arriving in Cheshire and I remember my mum being really sad. Um, but I don't remember that much. I remember like a few snippets before then, but not very much. Where in London were you? Uh, in Chelsea. Um, and did, huh. Okay. So it was just like mum's sad and now I'm in a new place. And yeah. new school, new kind of new, it was sort of a new everything. Um, I think the one thing that was like the real saving grace was that we had like so much, um, we had a lot of like outdoor space. And so we were just outside. And it's funny because now when I think of the UK and London, especially, I'm like, it seems to just rain all the time. But when I was a child, I remember it being nicer weather. Um, I remember like the summers being sunny and being outside a lot. Um, and we had horses, so we did a lot of riding and it was, you know, a, a, it was such a nice upbringing. Um, but, but I just remember being outside the whole time. And you had a good experience at school? Yeah, I did. Um, my school was, my school, it was a mixed school, which I'm glad I went to. Um, cause I hear, it's funny. I hear a lot of people, I don't know why I recently have been talking about like they wouldn't send their kids to mixed schools. Um, but I mm. loved being in a mixed school and I, yeah, I just, I, I had, I had really nice, I had really nice people in my class. Cause I know both my sisters, um, went to the school as well, which was nice. Um, and we were always a bit, quite a big family and we had another family that lived near us that we were, that also went to school with us. So yeah, school was always, school was always a good, like a nice place for me. And did you know what you wanted to do afterwards? No. So, well, so initially I wanted to be, I wanted to do dentistry because I always, always what I remember thinking when I was younger, and I think this comes from like, so my mum was a lawyer and I always remember thinking like, thank God, and she worked really hard. And I remember thinking like, thank God my mum like had her own career so that she could look after all of us. So I always had that main focus of like, I just want to be able to like look after myself, look after my family, like, I want to earn good money. That was like my sole focus. And so initially I was like, maybe dentistry would be good. And then I went to my uncle, my uncle's a dentist. And so I went to shadow him and watched him pull a tooth out and was nearly sick. And I was like, this is not for me. This is awful. And so I ended up going and doing economics at university. Um, and then I trained as a chartered accountant and then ended up working for a hedge fund uh, in London. Oh, cool. Which <laughs> so, fund? Uh, Marshall Waits. Oh, nice. Okay. I met Paul Marshall recently. Oh, did you? Yeah. And I know a couple of people who used to work there. I heard about the fountain and the private <laughs> chef. And... Yeah. I mean, those offices are the most beautiful offices I've ever been to in my life. Um, Ian Waits designed them. He's got the most incredible eye. He's 
and like attention to detail like you've never seen. Um, so I remember when I first started working there, I was like, and I'd been at PwC before, so it was sort of in London Bridge. And then I'm like working at this incredible office in Chelsea. There's like the private chef, there's the baristas, like everything you could ever want in a workspace. The workspace was beautiful. It was all like Soho House um, themed, like big plants everywhere, lots of space, lots of uh, big glass windows. And I remember getting there and being like, this is incredible. Like, this is the job I always dreamed of. And then as time went on, like, I started being like, oh, I just feel like I'm going to be doing something else. Like, this is the logical route. This is the sensible route. Like, I'm good at my job. I love my colleagues. Like, why can't I just be happy doing this? And so I decided to train in rapid transformational therapy along the side. So I was doing that in the evenings and weekends. And then I trained in coaching as well. And it kind of got to the point, oh, oh, that was it. I did this, I did this meditation on, um, on a retreat and it sounds a bit dark, but it basically took you to the end of your life. And then it told you to look back and see, like reflect on your life. Like what decisions were you happy to make that you made? What, you know, what did you regret? What did you wish you'd done? And I was just like, oh God, <laughs> if I continue down this track, like this is just not, I, I feel, I was like, logically everything was screaming, like this is the right track. This is, you know, when you want to get pregnant, you're going to get maternity pay. This is sensible. You've got to stay. But like this feeling just in my gut and in my body was like, nope, we can't do this anymore. And it just got louder and louder and louder. And then I just was like, okay, I've just got to, I've got to burn the boat. So I handed my notice in. I think I was like shaking, walking into that meeting. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> and my boss was like, um, I was like, I need to talk to you. And he was like, please tell me you're not going to quit. <laughs> I was like, oh God. Yeah. Um, so, but I ended up doing an extended leave uh, to do like train someone else and stuff. So it was, it was about six months. Um, and then me and my boyfriend, yeah, decided to move to Portugal and completely change our way of life. Oh my God. So this was only recently that you left. So I, I finished full-time last June and then I worked uh, over last summer until November. I was working part-time um, and then I finished uh, properly in November of last year. Got so, it. Yeah, all quite soon. So how long did you do at PwC? I did three years. And then as soon as I got my qualification, I quit that um, and then moved. Wait, and where did you go to uni? I went to Leeds. Nice. I've been to some of those um, clubs in Leeds. One of my friends went to Leeds and I went to you. <laughs> Leeds was so fun. It was great. I loved Leeds. Um, yeah, it was, it's a really fun city. If I say that, but do you know what? It was such a student town that I haven't actually been back since because um, it just felt like such a student town. But it is, it's, it's a great place for university. Okay, so all through that time, you're like, cool, I'm studying economics. I'll be an accountant or whatever. I'll do my plan of like being responsible and having a career so I can provide. <laughs> yeah. And you, an account, and you got through order. Were you in order? So do you know, I was in order in Manchester and then I, and then I was moving, I wanted to move to London and I also wanted to switch from audit to business recovery services. Um, cause I wanted to go and do like the Lehman brothers administration. So I switched, um, partway through, I think it was about eight months in I switched and, um, yeah, so no, I did, I did, but I did, I did audit for part of it. And then I did, um, business recovery services for the second part. Cool. Why was that interesting to you? Um, so, well, essentially, I just found audit so miserable. I would end up, I was in Manchester and I was like going to these warehouses and like just ticking, you know, stock checks. And um, I remember you'd, you'd go out to these like client sites, there'd be like no internet. You'd all be like using an orange card, like rotating and just like counting things in an Excel spreadsheet. And I just was like, oh my God. So I knew I wanted to move to London. 
and everyone was like it's not possible like you can't move to London like that easily and I was like no I'm gonna do it it's fine and applied to move to London and then when I sent my CV off I was like oh I can apparently apply not just for audit like there's some other ones and everyone was like you'll never get that approved because you only get your qualification if you're doing it through audit like you don't get it through the other ones and I was like well I'm gonna see and then I interviewed at two different places one was um doing banking um I think it was banking and markets in audit and then the other one was business recovery and I was like, the work-life balance seems way better in business recovery services. And then I also could go out and do like the Lehman Brothers administration, which I thought was so interesting. Um, so I, yeah, I ended up doing that one. Huh. Okay. So this is basically when a business is going through administration, you're helping wrap up like whatever accounts exactly. and stuff. Yeah. So there was like two traders that were at, Le- at the Lehman Brothers administration. Because actually when Lehman went under... It didn't have any cash, but it still had a lot of assets. Um, And so all of those assets had to be sold off, but they had so many, they couldn't be sold all at once. They had to be like, you know, done over years. And so I worked supporting the two traders who were doing all of the sales. Um, And I, I think also then I just like, I loved working with those two guys. They were so fun. They were like, we'd go out for drinks on a Friday afternoon and it was just such a good atmosphere. And that's when I was like, I don't want to be in, um, I don't want to be in a massive corporation anymore. I wanted to be in like a smaller, um, more boutique firm, which was huh. kind of the move, the move over so, to. Where did the, the traders work? So they were Lehman Brothers traders. Oh, so they stayed on. They so stayed on. Is- and then will there be like a restructuring team supporting or something or it's just that's like yeah. pwc is doing that exactly so the pwc did all the restructuring and then the two traders were ex lehman well they were still lehman and they were the ones that were doing all of the selling cool but from the us or this was the london guys no this was the london guys got it oh my god fun okay yeah, so that- you did that and then you worked on other administrations, presumably. Um, yeah, the other ones were all like really small ones. Lehman was like one of the biggest, the biggest uh, jobs. And then the other ones were small ones. And then as soon as I qualified, um, I think I left like a week after I qualified. <laughs> Got it. And you knew you wanted to go to a hedge fund? Yes. I think I'd heard like they were um, good places to work. The work-life balance is pretty good. Um, cause if you go into things like banking, I mean, my brother-in-law, he, when he was in banking, he was working sometimes till like 1am. And I was like, I, one of the things that I really valued was like actually having a life as well. Um, I wasn't like, I want to earn money at any means possible. It was like, I still want to have a life and do things. Uh, so I started interviewing at the hedge funds and then moved, uh, moved there. And they were, I mean, Marshall Base was a, an incredible place to work. People were really nice. Yeah, you worked hard. Yes, it was uh, in- it was an intense environment, um, but it was an amazing place to work. And I love like getting in, working really hard, and then going home, as opposed to like getting in, chatting a load, like you know, spreading it out until like eight or nine p.m. It was just like heads down, get your stuff done, and then and then leave, which worked perfectly for me. So, how long were you there for? I was there for about seven years. Wow. Yeah. I think if I'd been anywhere else, I would have left way, way earlier. I think like the inner conflict I had between like, this is a really amazing place and like everything, like there's nothing wrong with it. Why, why can't you just be, that's what I kept saying to myself. Like, why can't you just be happy here? Like, you're not going to get anywhere better than this. But it was just this, this, like inner desire to want to help people in a different way um and even last summer when i was when i was doing the sessions through the group that we're both a part of like i said to my boyfriend i have a thousand percent made the right decision because when i get when i do a session with someone and then they you know come back and they've had an amazing session and it's shifted something for them it's like it's the most fulfilling thing I can ever describe and I could never get that from any other work um and so even though it's it's uh it's been a more I guess risky route 
I def- it's, uh, there's been zero regrets whatsoever. I guess the only thing is, is that initially I was doing RRT and it was just one-off sessions. And now I don't do those anymore because I think the way that the mind works, it benefits a lot more from, from more than just one session, from like more continuous work, as opposed to just like you have one session and then, because that can create like a bit of a breakthrough. But I think like it really needs like more continuous, it needs more time, it needs more like depth to create real, real uh, shifts. Mm -hmm. How did you find RTT to begin with? So I actually did a session myself. Um, I, so I was a client first and I did a couple of sessions. One was on, funnily enough, one was on digestion, probably because I was always eating in this state of like absolute panic. Um, one was on digestion and then the other one was on not feeling good enough. Um, and I found them both to be really, really incredible. And then it just kept popping up. Like I was dating a guy for a bit and he was going to have a, I was thinking of doing the training and then I kept talking myself out of it. And then a guy I was, I was, had been on a few dates with, he started talking about it and then someone else started talking about it. And I was like, this keeps popping up again. And so that sort of ended up being the starting point of my, of my journey. Huh. And had you ever had much therapy before or like interest in psychology or been meditating or anything like that? So I did psychology at A-level and I was obsessed with it. It was by far my favorite topic. But I remember my mum was like, I don't think that's, it's not like, where do you go from there with a degree? Um, I think, so I always had like a real, I mean, I remember just learning all about it sounds bizarre, but like learning about like depression, schizophrenia and like all the different areas. And I just thought it was so fascinating learning about the human mind. And then even since then, I was always like really interested in any like meditation, breath work. But I, the things I always struggled with actually was like the consistency. Like I'd do something for a little bit and then I'd stop. And then I'd do something for a bit more and then I'd stop. And really the only time I've seen like massive changes is when I actually stick with something consistently for like a good month or two months. And that's when I start like really seeing the changes and then, and then you don't stop. And how did you hear about RTT to go and get those sessions? So it was a friend of mine that had done a session for, I think it was fear of flying. And she was like, oh, you can do it for all kinds of stuff. And I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. And I was at this phase where I was like experimenting with a few different things. So I was going and doing breath work sessions. And I was, um, so I did that as well. Um, and it was, so, it was a really emotional session. And loads of things like popped up, like random memories popped up that I was like, oh, like I didn't even remember where they'd come from. Um, and it's interesting. I've kind of changed my stance a little bit. She's, Marissa Peer's amazing, but she's very much of the, you've got to feel it to heal it uh, mentality. And since I started tra training with Dr. John Connolly, he's like, you don't have to feel it to heal it. You like, yes, that can be helpful in some circumstances, but the, he says, you know, you wouldn't, um, you wouldn't study someone in poverty to learn how to be wealthy. So it's not always useful to spend too much time in introspection, picking at all the things that, you know, we can spend years, can't we, going through like our childhood and everything that's happened and why this happened. And I think it can be useful to uncover what those beliefs are so we can move forward but I also think we can really get into a trap of always looking in the past, always looking at things that need fixing, always like, you know, going over things. And now I've actually, I actually think it's useful to know what the underlying beliefs are that are holding us back. But I don't think we need to go back and re-examine everything over and over again and get caught in the past. It's more useful to think like, okay, well, this was my belief. Let's shift this. And then how do I take action going forward so that I'm not, I'm not struggling with this anymore? Yes, it's so, it's so interesting. And 
Oh my God. Yeah. Cause that, <laughs> that was my thing for ages that it, it was like, Oh, I found the story like about what I was saying before, like my brother and Oh, this is why I feel like I'm not as loved and something. Cause I didn't get this attention. But then it was like, I held onto that story. And then it was so funny. My mom said to me the other day, she's like, Delia, you, it what didn't all, cause she's the one who told me like, Oh yeah, your behavior really started happening, changing. Like at this point when you were four, because of him getting diabetes and whatever. But then the other day she was like, Dilly, you were demanding even as a baby. Like you were like, caused me so much anxiety and stuff. I'm like, oh my God, I was a baby. You were just meant to like love me and meet my needs. But then it's like, oh my God, that like shatters this story or whatever. It just adds something. But then the point is like, who cares? Like, do I want to move on? Do I want to let go? Do I want to like have beautiful relationships with my parents and family now like which I do yeah I do have really good relationships but it's just still this part of me that's like oh you know with the lollies or whatever it's like okay that happened let's like heal and move forward and who knows like all the specific yeah you don't need to find every single memory or what the exact truth I mean it's impossible right because Mm. there's so many different things going on but it's like yeah, that's, that's, re- I mean, that's part of the reason I made this podcast for people to share their stories of overcoming things. And from a place of like, having overcome, like, yes, I was a drug addict. Yes, I was doing all this stuff that was harmful, or I went through depression, or I wanted to kill mm. myself or whatever. And now I'm here. And so we're not because so much, even I feel like a lot of messaging in society now, it's a lot of like, victim stuff like stuck in the story like it's someone else's fault this evil group of people is making me suffer and Mm -hmm. I can never I'm stuck here forever kind of thing which Mm -hmm. just doesn't help anyone no because also if you're if someone else I love um I could keep referencing him but this is another one of Dr John Connolly's ideas he's like what happens is things are happening outside the information goes into our brains. We process it and then our minds attach stories onto what that means. And so people aren't doing things to us. Something's happened and then our mind is set, is, is creating a story about it. And these happen unconsciously, but it, it happens outside of conscious awareness. We're not choosing these stories, but that's why you have two people that experience the exact same thing and they come out with different ideas of what actually happened because we're all processing things differently. And it's, I, I completely agree. There's a lot of like victimhood and this person did this to me. And it's like, I, like, I understand that sometimes awful things happen to people and it doesn't, it doesn't make it okay in any way, shape or form. But when you think that it's always someone else's fault, you have no control over their behavior, what they've done. You can't change anything in the past. And so for me, like, I'd rather look at, okay, well, where do I, like, I have the most power when I just focus on what I can control and how I see things. And, you know, instead of thinking, oh, this happened, because, because again, I think with the self-development world, we can get so caught up in like, this happened when I was a child and that means this and this means that. Whereas for me, what I found actually more useful now is like, what is the, like, instead of like going always looking for problems, like where, what am I experiencing right now? What's coming up right now? What is like, what pattern is coming up and what's the underlying belief underneath that? And then how can I clear that so that I can actually take action and move forward away from it? Um, Cause if we're always looking in the past at thing, we can't change the past. Like it's gone, it's literally disappeared. There's, there doesn't exist anymore. We can't go and do anything about it, but we can change like who we're being now, how we're showing up now, where we're putting our attention. Um, and it is a retraining of your mind because our minds are wired to pick up the negative. Like they're hardwired to do that because of survival. But so we have to like overwrite stuff, whether that's like, you know, I mean, maybe at first it's hard work to every time you go to the bathroom, like say something you're grateful for or say something you appreciate about yourself or something. But once you like, again, these are patterns which you can wire into your brain so that then you're just automatically doing it. 
um, like I don't, I don't think I've listened to the news. And my sister's, my younger sister, always gives me like tells me off for this, saying I should know what's going on in the world. I haven't listened to the news for like ten years because it honestly makes me feel awful. And I'm like, I, it, it, it doesn't help anyone else. Me showing up feeling more fear, more stress, more anxiety, because like whether people like it or not, like we are all energetic beings. That's why when you walk into a room, no one can say anything and you're like, oh, there's a vibe in this room. This feels like it's because we pick up off each other's energy. And so if I'm watching the news, it makes me feel awful and fearful and stressed. And then I'm going out into the world with that. You are transferring that onto other people and you're making yourself not feel good. So, you know, there is also like things that you can do throughout the day or throughout your life that just modulating like the thing, noticing like what makes me feel bad, whether it's a person, whether it's the news, whether it's like being in a certain environment and you don't have to, you know, I know like sometimes it's a work environment. There's things that people can't change, but you can always try and do the best with like the situation you're in. Mm. Yes. And we still, yeah. And we do have choices. It's not to say, I mean, again, that's why it's like, I do that. It's not to say that it's easy. I know no. how hard it is. Like I lost my brother to suicide. I know what can happen, but it's the fact that we do have choices. And even if, you know, whatever horror, it's like, yeah, you have to give yourself compassion for so many horrible things happen, right? Like mm -hmm. abuse, all kinds of things really bad thing so it's like you have to give yourself compassion but still realize like you have choices so even with work like work can be yeah I had like one of the I worked in banking so was that person that was there till 4am so I had the oh. worst worst situation and it felt like a trap but it's not like so many people feel like that with work but it's like no we this country abolished slavery we no longer have slavery you are free to leave like mm -hmm. yes it's hard it's not that it's easy but it is a choice so when mm -hmm. you realize all of these things are choices but mm -hmm. often it's like yeah you just need help as we were talking about like with stuff with like food when it feels like genuinely it's not a choice it's like okay then how do you do the nervous system work or whatever it is to feel mm -hmm. more empowered and it's so interesting since like going into into bit like business there's, uh, I don't know if you follow like Natalie who does um, Boss Babe and so many people are like your business success is determined by like the state of your nervous system. And at first I was like, yeah, sure, whatever. And now I'm like, it's so true because how much you can hold is determined like energetically sometimes that like, there's only so much you can hold and then it sends you into a panic. Like people might say, oh, I want to have a million followers on Instagram. But if that actually happened and then they're not getting comments that aren't very nice, they wouldn't be able to deal with it. And so, you know, it's so interesting how like a lot of the successful women that I see in business, they all have these processes where they're like regulating their nervous system to like accept new levels of, you know, visibility and success. And, um, and also, you know, I love, I love seeing like women also coming together because we, I mean, really what happened is, we work or the in like the 1950s it was like the ma the male workforce and the men like went to work and they the women stayed at home and then the men provided for the kids and the uh and the wife and then the women entered the workforce but we entered a male workforce and so it's not um it's it's not at all like adjusted i mean it has a bit but it's not completely adjusted for women and so for me now i'm like wow there's like all these women that are running these like seven figure businesses, they're incredible. They're like still at home, like they built these businesses where they're like at home with their kids in the day, they're still having successful businesses because they've got all these systems set up. And I'm like, wow, it, for me, it's so expanding because I'm like, that is a, there is another way. Like it's not easy. And it was handing my job in. I was like shaking trying to do that. I was panicking about money. I had all of these stresses. It's not saying it's easy. But it, I do think it's worth it. Oh, my God. Okay, we could have a whole nother conversation. <laughs> I'm so interested in that now. Like, I'm thinking about how, like, our hormonal cycle is different. But it's like we literally, 
use all this medication to make us more like in a state because men have the daily hormonal cycle so it's like they can just function differently to if you have a monthly cycle but it's like we it's like we're trying to make ourselves more like men to like fit into this thing and it's Mm -hmm. scary like now I'm exploring that what if I actually was just in my natural cycle and then had days where I felt differently and had to like behave different you know have less meetings or something whatever it is and it's so scary to be like does that make me weak or something oh yeah if you're tr- you want to design your business around which i think is one of the best things that came out of the pandemic is like more freedom for women to like design mm. things and what works for them but still be powerful and like find or be more powerful and more financially abundant because you're actually doing it in the way that works with like feminine energy rather than yes. forcing ourselves to be like in a box yeah even that thing you said about like the maternity leap like being like okay I will just give my life to someone else so they grant me time to be with my child it's like what (laughs) but also I'm like but fair enough like for the people that are trying to run businesses like I understand it from both sides like but that's why I love these like all these women that are creating businesses and they're running them on their terms and as you say they're doing it with like the flow of that cycle and doing it more in feminine energy and uh, you know acting from like a pace of intuition where because I mean, that was a huge thing for me when i left corporate and started my business i was like right we've got to hustle grind we've got to work you know six days a week we've got to get stuff done that like because i was so such a like achiever mindset and that just didn't work like i wasn't it was it it wasn't that fun my results were not that good. I think clients can pick up on it if you're working with clients because it feels like, oh, that energy they pick up on. And then when I was like, no, nope, no more. Like, I'm not going to be on my laptop for the first sort of hour and a half, two hours of my day. I'm going to have my my routine so I can get grounded, get clear on like what I want to achieve that day. You know, like once I slowed down, everything got better. Um but I was, it was so hard for me to not, because I was so used to just go, go, go. Um, and even my boyfriend said to me, he was like, my God, when I met you, you were so regimented. I was like, I'd get up at six, I'd go to the gym before work, I'd be at my desk at eight. I would like, you know, had like all my food that I was gonna have during the day. I was this like so rigid and so like fixed. And it's like, oh, like that's actually not how I enjoy being. Like I enjoy being a lot more like slower and I'm not getting the, the lie is thinking I'm getting less work done because I'm not, because when I'm actually flowing a bit more, I have way more creativity. And so, you know, if I'm doing stuff on Instagram, I would, when I first started, I'd be like sitting at my desk, like, right, I've got to create posts and nothing would come out or they'd be awful posts that were like, you know, quotes that other people had said. Whereas like if I'm outside or I'm on the move, that's when like inspiration actually flows uh, because I'm actually in movement. So it's definitely been a real relearning on how to work. Yeah, that's so interesting. Okay, wait, last question. Even though there's so much more we can talk about. <laughs> um, did you feel... I love chatting to you. <laughs> did you feel like... Did you struggle with the identity change? Like, okay, you're this person living in London, working at a hedge fund, and then now suddenly you're a coach in Portugal and trying to build a business. And because it's very out there, like you're using Instagram and everything, making videos, talking so vulnerably about like all this food stuff, which as you said, like there's so much shame around Mm. these kind of topics. Was that difficult? so hard so initially I was like I'm gonna be an offline coach I don't want to be online I don't want to do Instagram at all and then I was like got kind of curious and I told myself originally it was because I'm a private person like I I just you know I want to be private and then I was like I sat with it for a little bit and I was like no this is fair like I don't want to show up online I don't want to be judged by everyone I don't want everyone to be like what are you doing and actually I think 
interestingly, that's also one of the reasons I wanted to steer away from emotional eating because I didn't really want to share that that was something that I had suffered with. I had so much shame around it, so much guilt. I was so embarrassed. I was like, I, I'm like this, you know, I saw myself as like a high achieving woman that like has been really successful in working in like a hedge fund. And it was, it was hard enough to let go of that identity and just be like now, like, because I saw that so much as like people see me as you know, uh, successful. And now they're just going to be like, what is she doing? <laughs> um, so there was definitely that piece to start with. And also the turning up, the showing up on Instagram, I found terrifying at first. I was, cause, and it's like, why? Because we're so worried. We, we've got these like fears of being judged, fears of being rejected. Like we all have those because they're hardwired into us. If we get rejected, you know, 2 million years ago, we would die. And our, that part of our brain hasn't changed. You know, this conscious part of our brain is totally updated. It's like a brand new program. But this part is still exactly the same. It still runs on survival. Um, so every, you know, showing up on Instagram, I found terrifying. And then I hired my own coach and she was like, okay, we're going to put you on a visibility challenge. You need to go on stories uh, every day and just speak to the camera for 21 days. And I was like, <gasps> And so I did it. I felt super awkward, but I did it. And then I was, and then, and then I got my lips done and they swelled up and they looked awful. And I was like, oh my God, I can't go on. And I said to her, I was like, look, I'm really embarrassed to tell you this. <laughs> I'm out my lips done. And I can't, I just can't. And she was like, I think you need to share about your lips. And I was like, I can't, I'm not sharing about that. And she was like, I think you need to. And I was like, I think I need to as well. <laughs> so then I'm freaking sharing on stories. I was I felt so uncomfortable. I felt sick. I was like, oh my God, what is everyone going to think? Like I've got family on there. This is so embarrassing. And it was actually nothing to do with sharing that. And it was everything to do with like not caring what people think and showing because, because what happens is we build up these fears in our mind. And then when we avoid stuff, the fear gets bigger. And when you do something and then you're like, oh, I'm fine. You're literally showing your mind like, okay, it was a bit uncomfortable, but like, no big deal. And then, and then she was, and then I was talking to her about the emotional eating and I was like, I'm really passionate about this. Like it's created so much freedom in my life. It's changed my life, like, like breaking through this. And she was like, she was like, I think this is what you should be focusing on, but you will need to share your story. Um, and I was like, Oh God. And then I was like, do you know what? Like, this isn't actually about me being so worried what everyone else thinks. This is about me wanting to help other women who have had the same, the same issue. And I've had messages be like, oh my God, I've had such like amazing messages from people being like, this is exactly how I feel. Like, I feel like I've got this and this and this. And you know what, when we like put something out in the open, like the shame kind of just disappears. Cause you're like, it's like the hiding of things that makes it worse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh my so, God, this is so inspiring. But okay. it was not, it was, but again, it was not easy and it was really uncomfortable and like, but now I'm like, oh, whatever. <laughs> like I showed my, I, sh I sent a photo on, put it on my stories with my puffy lips, like sharing this is fine. You know, you kind of just break through and then I guess it, I guess what it does is it moves like your comfort zone out and then things just don't bother you so much. Yeah. I think that is really the key, tapping into, like I even had that today, I realised someone um, came on to do a second podcast, Silva, and she was sharing on Instagram like our first conversation, but I didn't put, I hadn't put the video up for it yet because it took me so long to do video because I was like so judgmental of myself and it's like no one fucking cares like people are there to listen to the guest and mm. to and it's like anyway it's like obviously you can't go backwards but it's just remembering like this is to help other people and this is like in service of other people no one mm. care like all that other stuff is actually ego yeah it's like a weird thing it's like the people pleasing thing being manipulative it's the same like being self-conscious is actually like you're really in your ego because you just thinking that people are thinking of you all the time but they're not <laughs> do you know what I also found like you I feel so much more free in myself and in my life doing these things because you're like oh whatever like 
it's not a nice place to be always worrying what everyone else is thinking. When you do, you share something like embarrassing and you realize, oh, I'm fine. Like no one actually cares. And actually people were like, oh, I hope you're, I hope you're okay. Your lips look puffy. I'm like, no one cares. Like, and you just like reach a new level of freedom of just giving less of, less of a shit what people think. Because people, most people are rooting for you. Most people want you to succeed. Most people and the people that don't, like, that's nothing to do with you. Like, I just, like, that's their own stuff that they're dealing with and they're projecting onto you. Like, you know, it's not our responsibility to um, worry what other people are thinking. It's just to, like, show up and do what we want to do. Yeah. Yeah. And straight away, the mind's just going to go back to them, like, oh, lips, like, huh? Like, should I get mine done or whatever? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay, last three questions, and then you have to tell us where to find you and everything. Amazing. Okay, unless you have anything else to add. No, I don't think so. Okay, how do you stay grounded? Um, one, getting out in nature, and that is getting out in nature with with nothing apart from like myself. So not you know listening to something while I'm going everywhere. It's like going for a walk on the beach or when I was in London, go, just going for a walk in nature with no distractions, just me and my thoughts. I love doing that. Even if it's like when I go to the gym, for example, it's just like a 10 minute walk, but just 10 minutes of just like me by myself. Um, that's a non-negotiable for every day. A uh, second one is breath work. And again, this doesn't have to be like, you know, an hour of breath work. It can literally be two minutes. But that to me is just like total, a total reset. Um, and then the third one that grounds me, I would say, I find meditation and journal good as like day-to-day -day practices to keep me grounded. But if I'm, if I'm not grounded, I can't, I find them too hard. I have to do like breath work or getting outside. So those are probably my, uh, yeah, getting outside and breath work, my two favorites. And then journaling and meditation more as like top-ups. Nice. Is there a book that's had a big impact on your life? Mm. Uh, Marianne Williamson, A Return to Love. I love that book. It's all, it, it's all about how like all suffering in the world really comes from fear. So it could be like fear of losing something we don't have, fear of not getting something that we want. Um, and when you like turn the fear into love, it just like transforms everything. Cool. What else has she written? Um, is hers? I always get confused. I haven't read A Course in Miracles, but the A Return to Love is like a take on the A Course in Miracles. Okay. Is she the one with the dark hair? Okay. Yeah, she does. Have dark hair. I don't know. That's the only book I've read of hers, and I read it. I've still got it. Actually, I brought it here with me. I read it ages ago, and I was just like. It was such a like softer way of looking at life. Um, yeah, it's a really, yeah, it's a really good book. It's actually a good reminder to me to listen to it again. And what are the, what three words describe the best version of Melissa Porter? Um, grounded, excited, and... And present. Nice. Yeah. Okay. So, where can people find you, or what advice do you have for someone who's struggling with something similar? So, you can find me at Melissa Porter Coaching on Instagram. I have a free masterclass which is going to come out on Monday, which is going to break down all of like, you know, why you're str struggling with emotional eating. There's some tools to overcome it. Um, so, that's going to be a free masterclass. Um, and then I do have a a uh, 30 day course that I'm launching after that, but I always recommend everyone start with a 30 day, sorry, with the free masterclass, um, just to see whether my uh, coaching approach they like. I feel like oh. it's all very individual. <laughs> nice, exciting. I'm so excited for the masterclass. Ah, amazing. Oh, it's been so good to chat with you. Yeah, you too. I'm so excited to re-listen to this. So I just love this food, 
food stuff, like proper end to suffering around food. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Let's end it. I'm like, it's, I feel like, you know, it's so funny. I think, I think like 80% of my friends, maybe not 80, maybe 70% of my friends have had some, some form of issue with food. I think it's so common, but like when we don't talk about it that much. Yeah. Cause of the shame. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. 